All right, I've got two minutes after, so let's go ahead and get started. And um, I'll do some introductions and uh, a little bit of housekeeping, and then we'll get uh, get rolling. So um, thanks, everyone, for making time to join us. I'm Frank Lomonti. I'm a newsroom legal counsel to CNN in Atlanta. I am obligated to give this disclaimer that I'm not speaking on behalf of my employer tonight. I'm wearing my university First Amendment researcher hat tonight, and we'll talk about some of that research in the co course of our hour together. Um, joined by a couple of uh, esteemed guests whose bios I'll give you in a second, but just by way of housekeeping, uh, two things. A, you should know that um, this is being recorded and it'll be available on uh, SPJ New England's YouTube channel. Um, and uh, B, um, um, since especially since a nice small group, we really want this to be an interactive conversation. And so please use that chat function, put questions in as we go along, and I'll try to field them uh, with the flow of the conversation. And if there's something that's really burning your hole in the pocket, in the pocket that you're dying to, to talk about, uh, we can unmute you, you can raise your hand, and we'll, uh, we'll do that. Um, but uh, with that, and with thanks to uh, Anam Senate and uh, SPJ New England for uh, pulling this uh, together, let me introduce our two um, our two co-presenters. Um, Catherine Foxhall um, has been a journalist for some 40 years. Uh, she got started in her hometown of Selma, Alabama. For about 40 years, she has covered health issues out of Washington, D.C., including 14 that she spent as editor of the newspaper of the American Public Health Association. Um, she has been working diligently, tirelessly uh, to keep this discussion alive uh, through her leadership in SPJ and SPJDC in particular um, about the gatekeeping function that public information offices are are are, are uh, performing and the chokehold that they have at all levels of government over the free flow of information. And we appreciate her sharing her expertise. Um, Brittany Haler is an award-winning investigative journalist and educator. She's out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She's the director of the Pittsburgh Institute for Nonprofit Journalism and also is a pro teaching professor of writing at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, she has been doggedly investigating the uh, Allegheny County Jail, uh, one of the subjects that we will focus on tonight, um, including taking Allegheny County to court uh, over their refusal to release autopsy records about uh, an inmate who died in the custody of the jail. So she is a, uh, a seasoned public records warrior. Um, she has been uh, published in Spotlight Pennsylvania and the Sierra Clubs magazine, the Pennsylvania Capital Star, and elsewhere. Where. And um, she, like me, is wearing two hats uh, tonight in addition to her, uh, or I guess three, her journalism educator and her investigative reporter hat. She's also wearing her plaintiff hat today because we want to talk to her about the case of Haler versus Allegheny County, which was filed just in August of 2023, challenging under the First Amendment the restrictive policies of Allegheny County that uh, prevent employees at the jail from talking to the news media. Um, so let's start it off with um, Catherine Fox. Hall. And Catherine, you have better than anybody else in America, the 30,000 foot view of this. And you have watched as these policies restricting the flow of information, restricting public employees from speaking to the news media have become more and more restrictive over time. So maybe you can share with us your perspective of what you've seen and, and how those kind of gatekeeping policies, those mandatory PIO review or approval policies are impacting the ability of journalists to tell important stories. Okay. So as far as we can tell, and I have talked to a number of journalists and SPJ did surveys, um, for about 30 or 40 years, there has been a, a surge, we would say. We know some things were going on before that time. But there has been a surge in these policies, all levels of government, business, nonprofits, et cetera, with agencies and organizations banning staff from ever speaking to journalists, at least not without reporting to the authorities, usually through the Public Information Office. And often as it winds up one way or the other, either by, like, by delays or whatever, not talking at all, okay? This has been a sea change. It is it it for somebody who remembers it beforehand. It's stunning. 
Um, there was no change in the Constitution. There was no significant discussion with the public during this whole time. I've looked at it from every angle because uh, it scares me to death, frankly. And I am now saying that this is an ongoing atrocity. It's an ongoing assault on civil, civil liberties that is inducing many other atrocities around the country. Um, what I would like people to do is to think about this and ask themselves, why isn't this a, an atrocity? Why aren't we fighting it? Uh, uh, what is our reasoning for not going after this hand and foot? Um, so my focus during most of my reporting has been federal agencies. Um, we had a remarkable thing happen, which I think is one of the most uh, important statements about journalism in the 21st century last year when Glenn Nowak, who had been head of media affairs at CDC during years when we were walking toward the missteps in the pandemic, he said, he came out with this and he said that the controls on what the agency could say how and when people could talk to reporters started in the Reagan administration. It got tighter and tighter without, with each presidential administration, basically because there was no pushback. Uh, the political layers of administration then and now decide whether a reporter can talk to someone and what can be said. He said the process was political. He you know, no doubt about it, it was political process and that it was successful in suppressing information that was unfavored by the powers that be. Uh, so as just one example, salient example out of thousands, we had an agency that was aggressively controlling the public scrutiny on itself or having that scrutiny controlled for it. Then the pandemic hit, we had multiple missteps by that human institution that was controlling its image. Um, so during and after the pandemic, we the reporters weren't there because we had been physically kicked out years ago. Majority of the time we could not talk to whom we wished. We could not speak to people without notifying the, the authorities. If reporters from a specialized publication had walked the halls or just talked normally to people at CDC in confidence, if need be, some of those things would have been resolved before the pandemic. I'm saying that as someone who covered CDC before and after the institution of those controls. Some of those things we would have never heard about because they were, quote, technical but some uh, newsletter focused on viruses or uh, lab or whatever would have created a tiny firestorm and things would have been corrected. To my way of thinking, okay, still today, not just with CDC, but the entire HHS, all 70,000 people, in HHS are trying not to speak to reporters without notifying the authorities. Most of the time they can't speak at all. Even as we're still trying to figure out what happened with COVID and what to do with the research on the viruses. Uh, millions of lives involved. Some of the people who know best in the world, in the world are under those controls because we're talking about NIH, CDC, et cetera. I'm just saying this is a horrific crime against humanity. Dictatorial control of what people can hear is not careful. It's one of the best, it's one of the deadliest things in all of human history. Um, leaders justify this by saying they want to be careful that things are correct. They want to help reporters employees who speak 
outside the uh, their limits, may not have the whole coordinating picture. They may mess up a carefully crafted public message, which you know we know is important for public health. The statement may be come out or it may be interpreted as a message from the agency when it is not. And all I can say is the leadership, when they say these things, they are exactly right. They are absolutely right. The uh, free speech is a mess. It can cause real problems. It's something we have to work on all the time. The only problem is that all these things put together is not a drop in the bug bucket to the deadly, bloodly, bloody monstrosity of silencing people. As I, you know, I just challenge anybody to look back to a moment in history when that kind of control has done anything but suppress and harm the population uh, as a whole. Is that enough for me right now, Frank? That, that's great. I'm going to turn to Brittany in a second. But just to underscore something that's so important that, that you said, you know, it is undoubtedly true that it is more efficient for government agencies to run without regard for the First Amendment, right? No one would dispute that if the First Amendment didn't exist, government could run much more efficiently. But the whole point of the First Amendment is to allow people to criticize, challenge, and question government. And so when people say the inability to restrict our employees' speech is interfering with the efficient functioning of the agency, it's exactly backwards, right? The, the, the functioning of the agency has to work around the speech because the speech is the thing that's constitutionally protected, not the efficiency of the agency. And so I just think it's really important that, you know, and, and, and everyone listening here is probably a working journalist. And so to just bake that into your own journalism, you know, to bake that into your own coverage. And we'll talk uh, more later on about how to cover this issue of the First Amendment rights of public employees and show you some resources that you can use. In fact, I'll drop some in the chat as we're going along. Um, but I want to turn to Brittany because Brittany is actually bumping her head up against one of these restrictive policies right now. Um, the work that she has done in Allegheny County covering the county jail there, which is, I think, charitably a mess. Um, there have been a number of, of deaths attributable to or 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 blamed by some on substandard health care in the jail. I want to invite her to talk about her coverage, and I'll drop some links in the chat as we're going along. But maybe you can talk to us, Brittany, about sort of both the way in which you have found that restrictions on employee speech are interfering with your ability to do your job effectively, and why you felt it was important enough that you actually became the face of what could be a groundbreaking piece of First Amendment litigation. Um. Hello, uh, and thank you, Frank, and thank you, Catherine, so much for having me and, and um, shedding light on this and uh, the work that both of you are doing. Um, I primarily, as you said, report on um, the Allegheny County Jail, um, and we are expanding um, our look from deaths in custody from, from Allegheny County to across the state, um, and that's been funded by the Pulitzer Foundation, or the Pulitzer Center, I'm sorry. Um, and that is because deaths in custody are a black box of information. Um, and what's happening in Allegheny County is not unique. And I'm sure everyone sitting here is aware of that. But um, in particular, jails are even more opaque. It's even harder to get information, um, at even um, something like policy. But then when you're talking about someone who has died in the facility, it, it has become such a, um, like, Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill is how I feel. I've been doing this for three years. Um, as Frank mentioned, I was uh, represented by the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press in a court case to, um, it was actually a public records request that turned into a court case. 
um, that we, a three-year journey just to get the autopsy report of a man who had died in the jail in 2020. Um, once the state court did rule in our favor and say, you know, you have, you are granted this record, we found out that they didn't actually conduct an autopsy. They did an external review. Um, so that's the level of just to fight to get no information, right? We ended up with like the same exact information pretty much that we had um, from the beginning. Um, that said, so because there are sources in the jail who are witnessing um, people have medical emergencies, they are notifying me when someone dies in the jail um, because the jail will not always report if someone has died in that in the jail. So I've broken stories of men and women or of men who have um, been transferred to a hospital, then released from custody. Um, the jail felt no obligation to report that because the person technically wasn't in custody. But men and women who are working inside that jail, you know, told me that name, made sure to get that person on record. Um, I have had to go around the fact that they can't be on record in order to confirm things I already know. And it has taken years to report on a death that I know what happened. And if that person could have been on record, we could have done that family justice sooner. We could have pushed for transparency. Um which is, you know, it goes without saying, but so I'm, I'm a specialist on the reef, right? I'm, I'm really looking at this one thing. And obviously this goes across all different kinds of government and cities all over the country. Um, but to answer your question of like, why, why file, like, why do I care this much? It's because we're actually talking about people who are dying and they, they do deserve the bare minimum of what happened, just the records, just and I'm speaking to men and women who are bearing witness to this, who are telling me things that are later confirmed, you know, through sometimes litigation, sometimes through public record request. And I and they want to be on record and they want to tell me, but they are afraid of losing their job. Um, and in their case, if they lose their job, we are down a worker in a jail like that in a, in a jail that is already understaffed in a jail that has a health crisis. So I'm not saying like someone losing their job in like, I don't know, the mayor's office isn't important, <laughs> but these are people who are literally providing the care to these folks who are watchdogs and you want them to keep their job, right? But you, I wouldn't say more so than anyone else, but it is a very, very delicate thing I'm navigating. Um, and um, my my lawyer is here. Paula is um, dropping some things in the chat. She has included our first case, and she is also um, the Reporters Committee of Freedom of the Press is representing me in our second case with uh, the Yale Law Center. Um, I don't know if that answered all your questions. <laughs> that's, that's great, and, and we'll, we'll unpack some more of this as we go along. <laughs> I want to throw some resources in the chat as well, just because um, so in my um, university uh, researcher life, I worked for the University of Florida's Breckner Center for Freedom of Information. And there at the Breckner Center, we launched a project called Government Gag that was specifically focused on doing research on this exact problem because it was such a habitual problem that journalists kept bringing to us, again, at every level of the government, all the way from Washington, where Catherine is covering the CDC and other public health agencies, down to the tiniest little police department or school district, every public employee seems to be struggling under one of these restrictive policies that says nobody can talk under potential loss of your job if you get caught without approval speaking to the news media. And of course, who's not going to get approval to speak to the news media, critics and whistleblowers and people with dissenting views, right? And so you're going to get a sanitized agency approved version of the truth. And this is inimical to, to good journalism, right? I mean, you're supposed to seek and print the truth, not seek and print the canned version of it that the agency serves up to you. And good investigative reporters like you do just that. Um, so at the Breckner Center, um, we dove into the um, the the just putting that in the chat right now. We dove into the First Amendment case law 
in this area. And we're very pleasantly surprised to find out that there are nearly two dozen instances of judges all across the country striking down these very exact type of policies, just like Allegheny County has on First Amendment grounds, because they are overly broad and they are not necessary for the agencies to do their jobs. And one of the things that's so important for folks to understand is that even though it's kind of culturally a, a thing that, that people give up their freedom of speech when they take a government paycheck, that's not what the law says. That's not what the Supreme Court has said. Over and over, the courts have told us that you do not surrender all of your First Amendment rights when you take that government paycheck, and that to the contrary, government employees sometimes have really important subject matter knowledge and expertise, just like Catherine was saying. I mean, who better to tell us about, you know, whether vaccines are safe than people who do that research all the time for a, the, a living at the CDC, and yet those people felt like they were unable to talk because of federal gatekeeping policies. And so there's the real informational cost here when, when people can't talk. But it's almost certainly against the law. Um, and uh, l- let me start, as I drop some of the resources in the chat on this, I mean, l- let me start the questions just with, with Catherine. Explain that paradox if you can. How is it possible that even though these agencies should be well on notice by decades worth of federal case law, that it is illegal to do what they are doing? How are these policies still so persistent and so pervasive? I hate to say this, but it's the it's the press's fault. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have this thing that goes back forever, as far as I can tell, that good reporters get the story anyway. Mm-hmm. And uh, we do get stuff, and some of it is quite amazing and impactful. There's just no evidence whatsoever that we get 10% of what is critical. Um there's no reason to think with these controls that the powers that be aren't uh, successfully, deliberately keeping us from knowing things that they don't want us to know. Um, we we uh, get stuff. It's like we're fishing over a 25-foot wall. We pull those <laughs> fish in and they're quite amazing and they're quite saleable. I mean, they we make a living, people are there's but we know nothing about the ocean. Uh and we are quite um quite successfully kept out from understanding having a good overview and understanding a lot of um a lot of what goes on. Why do we do this? We need their stuff. Uh, Victor Picard, who is a journalism critic, has said that one of the main things about uh, uh, this era of journalism is that we absolutely have to have the authoritative statements from officials to survive. I mean, if we couldn't talk about these statements from FDA and CDC and city government and police departments and everything, we would we we could go under. Um, so, um, and also, if we start talking about what we're not getting, we we discredit the agency whose authority we need to live off of, and we discredit ourselves. Let me ask Brittany if you have additional thoughts on that. I mean, I think that's quite right that journalists need access to agencies and that some of them are able to do their jobs adequately, especially in the climate that we're in right now when very few journalists have the luxury of drilling down deeply on one particular agency and covering it persistently. I remember going to an SPJ regional up in the Pacific Northwest a couple of years ago where one of the reporters up there was reeling me off the list of all the agencies that she was responsible for. And it was basically every school district and every higher ed ed institution in the entire Western half of Washington state was hers. And so uh, needless to say, right, she doesn't have the 
the time or the bandwidth to cultivate those sources, even if they were allowed to talk to her in the first place, because she's got to move on to the next story, right? So any other thoughts, um, uh, uh, Brittany, about why news organizations maybe have, have hesitated to take on these policies head on, even though there's every reason to think that they're illegal and shouldn't exist? Yeah, I I'm not an I'm not a lawyer. I don't know like in terms of the legality of it, but I I will say I am a hybrid I'm a, I'm a weird per, I'm a weirdo. <laughs> I'm an academic investigator. So I have a lot of privilege in that I have time and an obsession. And and I've been able to to knock on that door. I mean, the 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 county doesn't respond to me unless I mean, they used they didn't used to. And now they do because, you know, I have records and and I've been proven to to know what I'm talking about. Um, so you can report around it. It's hard. It's really, really hard. And you have to have um, the time and dedication to to be a specialist. And, and, you know, the way that news is working is we we. Uh, people, investigative journalists are few and far between. I also sometimes joke that was if I was working in a different county, I might not be an investigative journalist. Like I've, by the nature of these policies and, and how it's working, it's forced me into public records and 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 uh, long with working with a long memory and taking time and remembering something that was said three months ago at a certain meeting that could work now. Um, so these policies have pushed, pushed me into investigative journalism. I didn't mean to become one. Um, so it's, it's try it's fine. I think that I would love to see more investigative journalism on a local level. I would love to see, and I don't know what the answer is and I don't know what the solution is, but newsrooms that do exist, finding the time to allow someone to take time or just keep filing those records and keep something, keep your ear to the ground on a certain beat. Um, I think that's kind of not happening as often. Um, and we can get into funding we can get into like what is nonprofit news like do daily papers have the bandwidth to do that there's layoffs there's strikes there's i mean there's so we are in a in a interesting landscape but um i think just i also teach journalism right i teach journalism at pitt and and getting students to understand what a public records request is you know like the the slow boring work of of this kind of thing isn't sexy. Like it looks interesting, but in actuality, you have to be a little maniacal and um, you can get burned out by it. I don't know if that really answers your question, but it would be more so like me making a stake for more investigative journalism on a local level because you work within the community, you understand the nuances of that community um, and holding their feet to the fire over a long period of time. But how do we sustain that? How do we fund that? How do we make sure that that's happening? I don't I don't know. Well, you've actually opened the door to a question. Go ahead, Catherine. Yeah. A couple of things I would like to say about that, about in terms of how this how this interacts with investigative journalism. One is reporters need to be doing investigative journalism when they are doing a four paragraph story on what an agency said mm -hmm. that afternoon. You know, and this is something that has gotten lost in our culture because things are so blocked. If you if you know somebody or or even don't know somebody in the agency and you pick up the phone when you have maybe fifteen le minutes left to the deadline to the deadline and just blow your mind about the whole subject matter, it's not unusual uh, because when the official story is put out, it is so careful and so controlled um that's one thing those five minute investigations are they used to be tremendously important i doubt if anybody can do them anymore but uh the other thing about uh long-term investigation man i wish we had more of it i mean but 
I don't think even that solves this issue. Because, you know, you can just work for months and there are still uh, whatever it is, hundreds, thousands of people in that agency who are told to be silent. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, you can put out that article that you work months on and um, it's great and everything, but you 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 don't know what the people in the agency are saying. Are they around the water cooler crying or laughing or uh, it's it's a disadvantage of an unfree country that we don't have the routine feedback from the people that know. The other thing I would add to that too is I am incredibly lucky to have legal resources through the Reporters Committee of Freedom of the Press. I mean, just it took us three, almost three years to get a not autopsy. <laughs> like it took us three years to figure out that they weren't doing the due diligence that most coroners or coroners who are looking at dust and custody would have recommended doing. And um, I am a very, very small newsroom. We don't have the resources, the legal resources and money to do that. It's through pro bono representation that I'm here right now. Um, and I'm extremely lucky <laughs> to, to have that. That goes without saying. So, I mean, if there's a Brittany Haler or a Catherine Foxhall in, you know, some small town who like, how, how are they going to do that? How are they going to, to fight the fight without those resources. And, and they might not even know those resources exist. So you raise an excellent point. One point of hesitation might be, as Catherine points out, not wanting to burn the bridges of your relationship with an agency. Another, as you point out, may be lack of access to legal resources so that even if you were so inclined to bring a challenge, you might lack the funding or newsroom counsel to do that. I will say on that score, there's not that many things we're talking about tonight that are encouraging, but one thing that is encouraging <laughs> is that there are more resources today than there are in any time in my adult lifetime, thanks to philanthropy, which has set up a network of these legal clinics. Stanton Foundation is one of the big uh, benefactors in that space. Knight Foundation has endowed one at Columbia University. And so it's actually easier than it's ever been, in my recollection, to find somebody who will take uh, a meritorious case pro bono. We have an excellent one down here at the University of Georgia that I'm affiliated with and I guess teach at. And so uh, uh, almost every part of the country, frankly, has got some degree of coverage now um, that wasn't the case even five or six years ago. And so that, uh, is moving in a good direction, and I'm hopeful. Uh, uh, Yale is is one of the ones that uh, uh, that that is co-counsel uh, on your suit, and that's one of the biggest and the oldest of these clinics. But they're they're all over the country. And thank you, Dave, for dropping the link in the chat to that um, network of of resources. Um, let me, because Brittany, you you brought this up. And I think it's a good segue to talk about because you brought up the idea of, well, if nobody can talk to me, maybe I'll request their public records instead. I'll use the state FOI process to sort of get the information through the side door when I can't get it through the front door. What are some of the other tips that you might have? I'll start with you, Brittany, and then go to Catherine, that tips or piece of advice that you might have. You're a, a journalist and you know maybe either you're not inclined to file a lawsuit or you know, during the three years that you're that you're working away through the court, you still have to do your job. How how does a journalist try to best work around one of these restrictive policies that says nobody at the agency you cover is allowed to talk? Um, again, speaking specifically on deaths in custody, um, but I've covered the jail in different capacities and different conditions. But um, right now, we are trying to track jail just jail deaths in Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm sure it will shock you that they don't always report, <laughs> um, who's died to the federal government and then to the state, uh, and how we have uncovered hidden deaths in, in that, uh, in different counties within Pennsylvania is filing right to knows for communications, um, between different fr from the warden to the healthcare side of things, the deputy warden, um, with certain words, death being one of them hospital release. Um, also just looking through civil dockets, looking through docket, like seeing who's filed a suit against a certain entity. It's, it's 
it blows my students' minds all the time. Like, I'm like, yeah, no, first thing you should do is just look to see if somebody has sued. Um, and we found it, we found a number of deaths just through, through going through the courts. Um, <clears throat> uh, communications is a big one. Um, going through the courts, I'm trying to think of like, uh, figuring out your beat, figuring out what piece of paper is associated, just like what kind of paper gets produced in your in your and that I that gets really inside baseball which I could explain like 6a releases is a thing that I've been mucked up in the court in the in the uh the office of open records trying to get um but yeah it's kind of like and I I think it might be my lawyer Paula who explained it like this but um thinking about what you do in a day and what records are even produced in your daily life receipts and you know you go to the gas station or you you know you pick your kid up and you have to invoice for that like what are the receipts that you create in your day and how does that apply to your beat or whatever it is that you're investigating and getting really creative um going th through the wallet the price tag transports um we've right to node for 911 calls to cope, to see if there was an emergency or a death that wasn't reported. Um, again, hospital releases, we've done that too, um, just to name a few of it. But it really is like becoming obsessed with something and then getting creative with with how can, how does this work and what way can I can I figure out how to do this? So Catherine, your thoughts, tips, advice, workarounds, things that you've found successful in trying to get information despite the existence of one of these restrictive policies? Um, the one thing that I would add, which I'm sure Brittany knows, is find out who has left the agency. Sometimes you can get that through a FOIA um, sometimes you can get it just through databases. Uh, I have, I have kept old, uh, phone books in, in government, um, commercial books that list people in government and they're now 10, 20 years old, but I keep them because, you know, somebody would have left by that time, um, I I will tell you that I have become so radicalized that I'm scared for us to get workarounds. Hmm. And the reason is, I mean, I can't tell people not to do that. I mean, you have to do the best you can. But the reason is you you we it's our skills sometimes that camouflage um what is going on in in other words a skill reporter will find some ways and they will get a story and the story can be quite impactful and and there's still people in that agency who can't talk um and they they are in there saying yeah but and it scares me to death um, because we can make our money that way. We can put out a story. We can sell news news outlets. I, we can get subscribers. Uh, we can win, win prizes. Uh, we can assume that we're doing okay. And um, somebody's going to die because of what we don't know. I think too, to, in, in terms of death and custody, again, you have, I have incarcerated persons contacting me and saying this person has died on my unit. Um, I have their family, family members are a big, big, I mean, it's through their due diligence that a lot of these stories are coming out because they are the ones that are entitled to the medical records, which they have to fight for. They're entitled to the autopsy report, but then you have a government that is either avoiding their testimony or or denying it 
And, and then, but at the same time, there's people on the inside I know who work there who are echoing what the, the inmates are saying and who are echoing what these family members are saying. And that I think indignant, like if we're just talking beyond accuracy, just the dignity of it, that our community is seeing this happen. They're on the same, they're, they're echoing the same information, but they can't actually share that information. Um, and that's that's a major, I mean, that's the heartbreaking side of, of what I'm seeing and understanding in my reporting. I grew up during the Cold War. And this sounds so much like stories from the Soviet Union that it just, it, I don't know why everybody isn't scared to death. I mean, we, we talk free speech and uh, we have so many people scared to talk. Well, you know, and that's a very good point. Again, getting back to how do we cover, how do we write about, how do we broadcast about this issue? It is well recognized by people who cover international affairs that if you have a government that threatens people for speaking out against the government, that's considered to be a taboo policy, right? We look down on that. We consider that, oh, that's a banana republic type policy, right? What what kind of government would punish people just for being dissidents, right? What, what kind of government would punish people for being critics of the official regime's policy? And the answer is ours, uh, uh, the, the one we live in. And, and so we can recognize this as a, a real human rights problem if it is in any other country but our own. And it's probably time to think about it as a human rights problem, right? Um, there's a really good question in the chat that gives me a chance to uh, share another resource. Uh, a question is, does the First Amendment case law that protects the rights of public employees to speech speak also extend to something like a nonprofit organization? And the answer is yes and no. No, the First Amendment doesn't because the First Amendment only applies to the actions of government agencies, right? So you work for the United Way, you work for the American Cancer Society, you're not working for a government agency, right? So if you get fired by one of those entities because of something you've said, you don't have a First Amendment claim. You can't go to court and say my First Amendment rights have been violated because you don't have a government agency as your antagonist, right? But what you do have, interestingly enough, is some very rich precedent at the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB. And the NLRB has said um, that there is a legally protected, under federal labor law, there is a legally protected right to speak to the news media that is in many ways as good or better than the First Amendment right. And so in the private sector, and I'm dropping some resources about this in the chat, in the private sector, Instead of going to court under the First Amendment, what do you do? You file a complaint with the National Labor Relations Board and you are able to get relief from the policy. The NLRB will order the workplace to repeal that policy and to put empl employees on notice that they do have free speech rights. Now, two caveats. NLRB rules don't apply to every single workplace in America. It's not mom and pa's grocery store. It's got to be a pretty good size employer. But any employer, frankly, that's newsworthy that you're covering, you know, you're covering Tesla or Google or GM or whatever, they're all going to be subject to that, that rule. And the other thing is it doesn't apply to management level employees, right? So if GM, I'm just going to pick on them, if GM were to fire one of their vice presidents because the vice president said something in the news media that was contrary to the company's uh, a formal stated position, right? That person doesn't have an NLRB case because that person is management. They're supposed to echo the company line, right? But if it's an assembly line worker, it's a factory worker, it's a blue collar person, that person has an NLRB complaint. In fact, we saw this happen uh, a, a couple of years ago. The First Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals had a case brought by a hospital worker in Maine who was fired for criticizing the um, uh, management of the hospital. It brought under new management and sold the management company. And she thought that they were understaffing it in a dangerous way and that it was uh, leading to lots of turnover among the doctors. And she writes a letter to the editor of the local newspaper and gets fired for it. And the NLRB says, nope, sorry, you get your job back. She's allowed to do that as long as she's not 
doing it. You can't you you can't give away confidential information that has been entrusted to you, right? I mean, you can't say you know, here are the uh, uh, the the confidential personnel files uh, of all these people in the workplace that uh, I'm the keeper of, and I'm now uh, posting them online, uh, WikiLeaks style, right? That's not protected. Um, um, but as long as you're not doing that, you're just venturing like your own sort of opinion, impressions, expertise. That's all protected under NLRB uh, uh, precedent, and so uh, it's important to know that that um, exists. Other thing I want to say, uh, and then I would love for people, you know, to chip in some questions in the in the chat, like uh, like Chris has done. Um, when we're talking about what journalists can do short of filing a lawsuit. I always say, you know, interrogate these policies, right? Interrogate the existence of these policies because, A, sometimes you find out that the policy that you have been told exists doesn't really exist on paper or in any rule book at all. It's just sort of water cooler chit chat, right? And water cooler chit chat is not an enforceable rule. Uh, uh, so I would FOIA the policy. I would use your Public Records Act to say, okay, you have a rule, you have a handbook, you have a regulation here that says that if you talk to the press, you get fired. Show it to me. I want to see it. And A, sometimes you find out it's actually not in existence at all, or B, you find that it's not as broad as you've been told it is, or C, sometimes you find out that it's just not legally valid, right? Or you find out, well, no, this actually contradicts the case law in our state or in our uh, uh, regional circuit, and so it's an unlawful policy. And 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 now you've got the the, the signed confession because they've given you a written copy of it. Um, and you know if you find out, and I think in 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 some instances you find out that this is really a sort of a memo that the public relations office has sent around to people in the agency, so it may not really be a quote unquote rule at all. It's more like a a, a preference by the person who runs the public relations uh, uh, department. And so that may not actually be have have any force, right? I mean, if I work for uh, you know the city of Atlanta, I don't work for the PIO, right? PIO doesn't supervise me. That person doesn't have hiring and firing authority over me. And so even if I get crossways with them and I do something that they don't like, right? That, that's not a firing offense. And they're just mad at, me, right? And so again, you want to sort of interrogate this policy, find out, you know. Who adopted this policy? Does this actually really exist anywhere? Does it actually have any teeth to it? And write about that, publicize that, because sometimes you're publicizing it could give people the reassurance that they need to come forward, right? Like, oh, this is not actually, this is just a, a, a letter that the PIO tacked up on a bulletin board somewhere. This is not a real rule at all. Um, and if it is a rule, I would go to the agency head. You know, the next time that police chief or that sheriff is having a news conference about something, you know, they want to show the, the big stack of meth that they've confiscated and they're having their, their, their press conference, ask them, you know, hey, chief, uh, I understand that there's a rule in the rule book that says that if you get to, uh, caught talking to the press, you get fired. Um, is that your rule? Did you like put that in the book? Why is that there? Uh, is that something that you support? Would you fire somebody if, if they got caught talking to the press? You know, make them own it, right? Make, make them own it. Um, the, um, there's a great, let's see here, series of questions here. I'm a reporter. I'm facing PIO controls. What can I do within my busy schedule, lack of legal support? What do I do? I think we've been addressing some of that, right? Which is think about filing public records requests. Um, obviously think about challenging the policy, you know, pushing back on, does this even really exist? Is this a real thing? Um, is it what I've been told that it is, or is this being overblown or overstated? Um, go ahead, Catherine, other thoughts there? Uh, the other uh, obvious thing is to write about or editorialize about it. It is an issue. For instance, if you if a, a nonprofit uh, has these rules, wh why do you is it, why do you want to give money to them? You know, it's necessarily going to impact what the what the public knows about the agency and the public needs to know that no that this isn't just accepted culture it's it's uh, it impacts what they know about the people who impact them if if a company if a private or a public company has these rules uh the question is should you be should you should what does the public not know because of that um should we trust the company who is silencing everybody who knows anything really about what they're doing um i think there's a there's that is always should be in your mind as a journalist uh, 
I see Dave Coolier, who is my successor at Breckner at the University of Florida, um, has shared some resources already in the chat, and I'm going to share some more. Um, but one of the great ones is uh, I dropped the uh, Breckner Center, which is just Breckner.org. I dropped their um, research page. Um, in the chat, and there are easily half a dozen research papers in that chat addressing them in, in that uh, section of the Breckner website, addressing themselves to the illegality of gag rules in various contexts. So gag rules in the context of policing, gag rules in the context of uh, college athletics, which are a thing. Um, recently, we published one about gag rules in the context of uh, people who work for uh, student housing at universities, many of whom are laboring under these don't talk to the press or you'll get fired rules. And those are, in my opinion, particularly noxious because not only do you get fired, but you also get kicked out of your home. Uh, and so that's an especially coercive policy and one that I, I, I wish I, I would love to see somebody um, somebody challenge. Um, the uh, main coast regional uh, case uh, out of the first circuit that I referenced, um, I'm going to drop that. There we go. It's a 2021 case. I drop that into the chat so that people are aware that that exists. Again, that's a private sector NLRB case. Um, there is also a question. Oh, I, Brittany, please take bring us up to date on there. Your suit was just filed in August, right? So in federal court terms, um, it's still a baby. Uh, I, so uh, it's still taking baby steps. What's what's the status of that and what will happen next to your understanding? Basically, the county has to answer to our complaint um, and we're expecting that to come in next month. So we're like in infancy at <laughs> in, in terms of timeline. So that's where we're at right now. Oh. I'm actually curious, how has filing that lawsuit, if at all, changed the dynamic of your relationship there? Have you noticed any change in the dynamic? Has anybody changing the way that they behave or is it business as usual? Uh, still like pulling blood from a stone. So <laughs> it hasn't really changed. Um, uh, I haven't really noticed a change, to be honest. I, I actually have a pretty decent rapport with with most the PIOs you know I know they're just doing their job um and um I've been working with them for a long time and it the answer is still like no comment you know or whatever or some watered down restricted version of of what I know to be happening so um you know it wasn't like I was getting a lot of information anyways <laughs> so it's it's the same for me yeah well, we have just a couple minutes left in the hour, and while I want to invite people to drop any last questions or, or comments or, or resources into the chat, and actually, I'm going to drop one uh, as well. Um, I'll find this, and there we go. I wanted to make sure that people know how to support Brittany's work at the Pittsburgh Institute for Nonprofit Journalism. So I'm going to drop your donate link into the chat. Uh, I should never be shy about asking for money if you do good work. Um, and and uh, 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 Dave uh, Coolier has dropped uh, the Student Press Law Center, my favorite charity, into the uh, chat as well. They always could use your support. Um, but now that uh, I've gotten to do that chat, I, oh, here we go. Here's a really good question. Um, talked about attacking these policies through litigation. What about laws or policy changes? Has there been any successful advocacy, great question, to change a policy or um, some really good model policies um, that we could that we could show as an example of agencies that are doing it right? Any thoughts? Catherine, anybody that you've encountered in your know. world that is doing it right? Um there are fewer and fewer on the federal <laughs> level and the hard the, the difficulty with me or anybody researching that is that you you if they have a good policy on paper you have to get in touch with a number of reporters to find out how it works in reality you know if they're not if 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 they really feel free to speak um I I will I will tell you I haven't I haven't acted on this but I found out that my little bitty suburban town had this policy which just blows my mind and I I I thought what I should do is write them tell them that I'm active in this 
um, in this fight and I'm and ask them, please, as a progressive community, be the first community I know to rescind this and say in no uncertain terms, people can speak to the press or whomever they wish. So as as is true of many questions in this area, there is a Breckner research paper for that. Um, I have dropped in the chat. Um, one of the projects that we did during my time at the University of Florida, King County, Washington, uh, uh, where Seattle is located, reached out and asked, could we consult with them on a model policy for their law enforcement agencies because they were having problems with uh, media relations and with, frankly, releasing information that wasn't always accurate. Um, and so we drafted up a white paper that uh, is now linked in your chat that would represent our attempt to, and it's not a utopian policy by any means. I mean, we didn't, you know, we wanted to make it a realistic policy that we thought had a, a a chance of actually getting adopted and used, and, and King County uh, uh, adopted a a fair bit of it, um, although not um, all of it. Um, and so King County, Washington, is certainly one that one might look at um, as an example. And I'm going to drop another one in the chat while we're talking. Um, any uh, <laughs> Brittany, any thoughts about it? Have you encountered any agencies that uh, that 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 seem to be respectful of um, allowing their employees to speak? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> full stop. No, <laughs> honestly. You know, uh, a government, absolutely not. No. Yeah. So the, the other example that I was thinking of, and this is uh, referenced in one of the recent Breckner research papers, is at the uh, University of North Carolina. They um, were called out for a, a very restrictive policy about their campus housing employees, one that was a, a hard gag that threatened people with the loss of their employment if they got caught talking to the media. They did the right thing at Carolina. They actually revised the policy. They adopted it. I think they were uh, a, a little bit running scared of a First Amendment lawsuit, but uh, uh, you know, people do, uh, do 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 good things for uh, for bad reasons. Uh, uh, that's still a good thing. <laughs> um, and so, uh, uh, even if they were doing it to avoid being sued, the outcome was quite good. And the policy that they ended up adopting is actually one that I would uh, happily hold up to other uh, campus housing uh, agencies around the country. So, yeah, it's possible. To to ask the answer the question about is it possible through advocacy to get a good policy on the books? Yeah, it is. But honestly, bargaining in the shadow of a lawsuit is sometimes the most effective way to do it because that's an attention grabber for people, right? I mean, one of the reasons that it is so hard to make progress in this area, and 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 this can be kind of a, my closing thought, and I'll invite any closing thoughts from anybody else. One of the reasons it's so hard to make progress in this area is the incentive system is so lopsided, right? On the one hand, the reward to these agencies like the Allegheny County uh, uh, Jail System, the reward to them for clamping down on the information is very immediate and tangible, which is scandalous information doesn't get brought to light, and people in authority get to keep their jobs, right? So that's a very tangible result. On the other hand, right, what's the worst thing that can happen to them on the opposite side of the scale? They get sued under the First Amendment, which, as we know, rarely happens. They lose. And then what happens? The taxpayers pay the attorney's fees, right? Uh, uh, the, the individual people who've been violating the First Amendment will pay exactly zero dollars. You and I will write that check. And so as you can see, right, the risk and reward here, the upsides and the downsides, tilt pretty lopsidedly in favor of continuing to violate the employee's First Amendment rights. And that's just baked into the incentive system. And it's why, and I'll get off my soapbox with this thought, it's why it's so important for journalists to sort of impose reputational consequences on these agencies, to call them out for being violators, for behaving unlawfully, because that might tip those scales a little bit in favor of turning square corners and obeying the law and doing the right thing. Um, anyone else have a concluding thought as we let folks go for the evening? Uh, my concluding th thought is we as journalists are very much responsible for this having happened. We walked into this over time as it gradually got worse and worse we fell back on the old saying of good reporters get the get the story anyway um 
And my principal thought is if you're having to work under these conditions, under these restraints, it is immoral journalism to get a story, to get stories, even though they may be very good um, and keep your paychecks coming. It's immoral to not fight this at the same time. Uh, writing about it, explaining it, editorializing about it, maybe uh, uh, filing a suit. The reason is if if you get a story and it's it's good and everything, but with all those people silenced, it's a, a good bet that you're missing half the story and it can really hurt some people. So I'm going to drop one more thing into the chat. This is a paper that uh, one of my excellent law students, Jess Turkovich, and I worked on for the Akron Law Review that surveys all the biggest law enforcement agencies in America, huh. looking at the policies that they have on the books. And surprisingly, what we found is that some law enforcement agencies on paper have quite good policies that a First Amendment lawyer would happily bless, but because they are not widely known to the workforce, people are under the impression that they are more restricted than they've been told that they are. Uh, uh, Detroit has a decent one. Cleveland has a decent one. Uh, uh, Chicago had a decent one. Um, and uh, uh, when you look at um, uh, the Chicago news media and how it reports on police there, we, we, what we found is that Chicago Chicago Police Department does not have a rule on its book saying do not talk to the press without approval. But invariably, when you look at the Chicago Tribune or the other local media there, they will say, we've been told that this rule exists, that nobody is allowed to talk. And so there is a dissonance between the water cooler messaging and the official word. And that's why it's so important to dig down to the bottom and find out and publicize if the policy happens to be a good one, protective of First Amendment rights. Brittany, take us home. What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, not taking, don't take no for an answer has sort of been um, my whole journey. <laughs> and um, questioning what you are hearing from the government and, and not just wholesale reporting out of that press release. Um, and something that we talk about a lot in in this death and custody stuff that we're doing is um had george floyd crossed the threshold of his jail we never would have known what would happen to him Thank you. he would have entered a black Thank box you. of information and it was only because someone else saw what happened that we know what happened and the his cause of and manner of death was natural according to the government yeah right? like they ruled that he had died of fentanyl and a heart attack or something um, but because we had a young girl with a camera, we know what actually happened. And that is a, a clear example of all of the hidden information. You know, it, if they had just been successful in getting him to that jail or keeping him in custody and make, getting to him to a hospital, we would have known nothing. Um, so so um, I think just questioning everything and, and not take it, you know, you are entitled to the information. There are people who want to talk to you um keeping your nose to the grindstone and 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 just being skeptical really <laughs> which is you know and then of course challenging everything that you can i don't know just be bullheaded about it <laughs> All right. Well, I want to give our warm thanks to Catherine Foxhall, to Brittany Haler, to SPGA New England, um, to Paula from Reporters Committee, who joined us and uh, gave us some very helpful and useful links. Thank you for everything you're doing on behalf of uh, Brittany and on behalf of the First Amendment. Um, and uh, this uh, discussion will be up on the uh, SPJ New England's YouTube channel, and uh, we encourage you to share it. Thanks so much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.